morning. I read uh, actually the uh, passage to verses 44 through 50. We looked at verses 44 through 46. This evening we're going to look at uh, 47 to 50, the rest of this paragraph. Um, would you listen carefully to this as I read it? This is the word of our Lord. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing. Well, I've already mentioned to you that this morning we saw that Jesus was sent from the Father for a specific purpose, and that was that he might be an ambassador of peace, not one who comes to judge, but one who offers the message of reconciliation. We also saw that because the Father sends him, because he was his representative and sent with his authority to make this offer, that everyone who received Jesus received not just him, but also uh, the Father as well. We also saw that Jesus was more than just merely an ambassador. An ambassador is one who comes with the authority of the one who sent him, but this one shares the same nature as the God who sent him because he is God in our nature. Remember Jesus said that if we were to see him, we would see the Father, by which he didn't mean that they were the same person, but rather that they share the same nature and have the same holy character. And that is simply to say that Jesus was perfectly suited to be the one who would bring the gospel to us on behalf of the Father. And that's exactly what he did. As God's herald, he declared the truth to us, as we saw, with a heart that really desired the salvation of those who heard it. He has declared it so that we who were in darkness, again, we saw that meant that we were ignorant of God's truth. We were basically sinful. Our hearts were dark with evil and who were under God's judgment. We who are in this condition might receive the light of the gospel, the truth of God, not only the truth, but through that truth be transformed so that we would have a love of what is right, we would have his light in our hearts, and that we would have light for the future, or hope, the hope of eternal life. And then the last thing we saw was this, that having received Jesus, we need to understand that he has also appointed us as his ambassadors. Uh, he has actually saved us in order that we might do this. He has entrusted us with his word. He has entrusted us or given to us his Holy Spirit so that we might bring his good news to all who will listen to us. And those who receive us, Jesus said, receive him. And in receiving him, they also receive the Father who sent him. Now this evening, Jesus again reminds us of his present mission, and that is to bring good news. He didn't come into the world to judge the world. He didn't come to condemn the world, but he came in order that the world might be saved, by which we understand not each and every individual, but that people from every nation, tribe, and tribe. But he also tells us in our text that the time would come when that work would be finished, and it would be time for judgment. Now we know that Jesus is both Savior and Judge. We know that he came to save all men, 
And we know that one day he's going to judge all men, but the important thing we need to see right now is that now is not the time of his judgment. Now is the time of salvation. Now Jesus, as we know, had just preached. Uh, this is really towards the end of his ministry. Right now we're looking for the last week of July. He had preached not only at this Passover feast, but throughout the three and a half years of his ministry, he preached throughout Palestine. We've seen that there's relatively few that had received the Lord Jesus Christ, but there were many more that did not receive him, who had heard his message, who had understood what he had said, and some, I think many of them, even knew he was the Messiah, but they still refused to believe. They still refused to repent and receive him. They did not respond to his call. Now the question is, how did Jesus respond to them? Did Jesus get angry? Did Jesus threaten judgment against them? Did he pray to his Father, calling down, as it were, uh, the legions of angels? Did he call down fire from heaven? Actually, we, we see that his response was really quite the opposite. Our Lord Jesus says in verse 47 of our text, If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. I'm sure those are very comforting words. They're comforting to us. We're thankful that the Lord came not to judge, but to save. We need to understand Jesus comes, I think, it's been put in another way. Jesus comes the first time as a lamb. The second time he comes as a lion uh, when he comes to judge. But now is the time in which our Lord appears as Savior as the one who, through his death, has reconciled the world to himself. Now just think about the whole tone of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which we saw not too long ago. On that day when he rode in Jerusalem, on the back of that donkey, as he was approaching the city, we didn't read about this in John's Gospel, but we do read about it in Luke's Gospel knowing what it was that was waiting for him at the end of that week, which, of course, was his crucifixion, his rejection, his trial, his condemnation, his crucifixion, and so forth. Knowing that that was waiting for him, as he was entering into Jerusalem, he didn't threaten judgment. He didn't, again, threaten to call down fire from heaven, but rather we read that he wept over the city because of what was coming on them. And again, here I think we see something of the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read in verse 42 of Luke 19, as he's weeping, he says this, to Jerusalem, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make the peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. But Jesus wasn't weeping over the fact that he was going to have to face death. When he was facing death, he would recall in the garden, he was sweating blood looking into the fiery furnace of what he was going to have to endure of God's wrath to save his people. Here he's looking over the city and he's weeping because of what was going to happen to them. If they had only known, if they had only seen the things that make for peace, peace between them and God. I mean, Jesus had come to reconcile them. They were his, his people, but they were his enemies. And having rejected the Lord Jesus, uh, basically... The Lord was going to reject them. Now, he was going to give, of course, opportunity to all the Jews to know the promises had been fulfilled. He was going to bring the gospel to all of them. But after that, there was going to be 70 AD. Now, even when he was on the cross and had gone through all the, the, you know, the humiliation before the Roman authorities, gone through the mocking, the shame, uh, the, the scourging, as you know, pain of crucifixion. We see him on the cross. And again, we don't hear him praying that the Father would send judgment, would bring down his legions of angels to destroy Jerusalem, but he prays that God would forgive them, the Father would forgive them. Again, in Luke 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Again, Jesus, the day of his mercy, the day of his grace, the coming of the Lamb, the coming of the Savior, his heart and his desire is still for their salvation. And the Lord did answer his prayer in many of them and brought them to save the day. 
when we think about the ministry of Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry, what condemning action did Jesus ever take against the Jews during this time? I think you'll find there's no place in Scripture where we find him threatening judges or dealing out retribution. There was one occasion when he sent his disciples ahead of him to a, a village of the Samaritans, which was on the way to Jerusalem, uh, to make arrangements for him to spend the night there. And the Samaritans refused to receive him because he had his face set towards Jerusalem. Now, when they didn't receive him, James and John suggested that Jesus do exactly what um, we're saying he wouldn't do, and that is bring judgment on this village. Uh, they said to him in Luke 9, verses 54 through 56, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Remember when the soldiers came out to arrest Jesus and Peter stood up to defend him and drew his sword and cut off the, uh, uh, the ear of one of the servants. Jesus said to him in Matthew 26, verses 52 through 53, Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal? Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. He could have, but he didn't. Because Jesus did not come to destroy men. He came to save them. Now, we do need to understand this doesn't mean that Jesus never pointed out hypocrisy. He certainly did. He certainly warned, especially the leaders of Israel, warned them of coming judgment. But he never executed that judgment while he was on earth because that was not why he was there. That was not the time. He came as a savior. He came to warn men of their danger. He came that they might turn to him while there was still, of course, the opportunity. He came to preach the gospel in order that he might gather together his lost sheep. He came that he might show his disciples what it means to love your neighbor as you love yourself, uh, especially by laying down his life, because greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus showed them what it meant to love. Uh, he came also, to, as we saw before, that through his death on the cross, he might cast the ruler of this world out, that he might send his disciples out to the world, that he might save people from every nation. Jesus came to prepare his disciples to carry on this work after he had died and been raised and ascended into heaven. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is judge, but he came first as Savior, and he continues to be one to this day, and he will be until he comes again. Now, I thought it was interesting because um, that doesn't mean that what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 isn't true. Uh, Paul tells us in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. When Jesus said that he came as a savior, he hasn't come to destroy, he wasn't meaning to say that God doesn't deal with sin or with sinners or that there's no consequences for sin in this life between now and the day of judgment. We do see Romans 1 being fulfilled, I think, every single day. I mean, just look at the news reports. I'm sure you're all aware of the things that are going on. We see the direction that our nation is going. We see our Lord handing this nation more and more over to greater and greater sin. That is an act of judgment of God against this nation for its wickedness. But what Jesus is saying here is that the final judgment waits for another day when everything that men have done will be required of them. Well, that's what Jesus tells us next in verse uh, 48. He says, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. 
the word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. The fact that Jesus came as Savior does not mean there isn't coming the day of judgment. There certainly is. And Jesus is warning them of exactly that same thing. But again, he's warning them in, you know, for the, the purpose of trying to get them to see and to turn from their sins. At least as many as the Father would call to him at that particular time. We've already seen there was this judicial hardening because they had to turn him over. He had to be crucified in order for his people to be saved, in order for us to be saved. Now let's consider for a moment what Jesus is saying in verse 48, what he's saying and what he isn't saying. First of all, Jesus is not saying that he will not be judged on that day. I mean, we might think that's what he's saying. He goes, um, you know, he who rejects me does not reject or does not uh, receive my sayings as one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Is Jesus telling us here that he's not? No, it, clearly he is going to judge us on that last day, both the redeemed and those who are not redeemed. I think it's quite clear from other parts of Scripture, such as in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 through 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Clearly, Jesus will be judge on that day. Clearly, we are going to have to stand before him and give an account of our lives. I do believe that what Paul has in mind here is all men standing before Jesus, not just Christians. This, remember, there's only one final judgment. Sheep and goat judgment. There's both believers and unbelievers. There are going to be those who did the good, those who are on the right, and there are going to be those who didn't, those who are on the left. So everyone is going to give an account. Thankfully, if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only thing that will be judged in your life are the works you did for him. And some of those will be of value and some of those will not be of value. But your sins will not be judged on that day because your sins have already been judged uh, on the cross when our Lord Jesus Christ died. However, among the goats, everyone is going to be judged for everything that they've ever done. So Jesus will judge one day, and it will not just be the words that he was speaking that will judge them. Now, Jesus is also not saying here that everyone is going to be judged only by what they heard and understood Jesus saying. Because on that day, the Bible says everything is going to be weighed in the balance. Even every careless word that a man speaks, he has to give an account for on the day of judgment. That is, again, assuming they haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe that means the Christian would have to do that because Christ has taken them all away. And the Bible says he will present us blameless on that day. Paul writes regarding the Jews in Romans 2, verses 5 and 6. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. Each person will get exactly what they deserve. Again, if they're outside of Christ. If you're in Christ, even the rewards he gives us are things we, we really don't deserve, but they are rewards of grace because Jesus cleanses them and makes them acceptable to the Father. Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. So again, it's, it's not just what Jesus has spoken with regard to the gospel, because I believe clearly that is what he's referring to when he talks about uh, the word will judge him. The word that I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. I believe in the context he's referring to the gospel. There's other things that people are going to be judged for on that day. Everything that they have done that is sin. Now, the Jews are going to be judged by the light that God has given to them in his law. They possess the law. It tells them the difference between right and wrong. It's a great blessing to have it. But having it and not keeping it simply makes one accountable, which is what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 2 when he says they were stubborn and unrepentant. They were not obeying the Lord. 
Those who don't have that law are going to be judged by what they know of that law in their consciences. The Bible tells us that there is still within man some idea, some, some uh, remnants of that moral image of God that we originally were created in that was once impressed upon our hearts but was lost in the fall. There is still some idea, there's, there's this, this innate idea of what it is that God requires, and the Bible calls it conscience. That's why conscience you know, tells us when we've done right or when we've done something that's wrong. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 2, verses 14 through 16, and again, as I, as I look at this passage, I'm reminded that I do believe that Paul here was referring to Gentiles actually, uh, Gentiles who had received the Lord Jesus Christ. And this isn't talking about unconverted Gentiles, although oftentimes it is understood in that way. I do believe there are passages that tell us quite plainly that even those who are unconverted would still have this. But notice the Gentiles uh, who don't have the law still have an understanding of it. He says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. I do believe Jesus, uh, that Paul here is referring to Gentiles who are converted because it says they show the work of the law written on their hearts. That, to me, sounds like what the author to the Hebrews is talking about when he talks about the blessings of the new covenant. God will take that law that's on stone and he will write them on the fleshly tablets of the heart. Now, does that mean that there is no passage that tells us that people have a conscience and they understand what God requires even though they don't have the law? Well, I believe if we were to look, and we don't have this passage on a slide, but if we would look at the end of Romans chapter 1, where Paul gives a, um, uh, this rather long list of all the evil things that people do. He says in verse 32, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. I think in the context, it is talking about the world which has fallen away from God who worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who fall into these moral perversions, such as homosexuality, uh, that he's referring to the world and that they do all of this evil. Certainly it was true of the Jews, but it's certainly true of the world as well. But notice he says, they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. So there is this understanding of God's law and those who don't have the written law are going to be judged by conscience, by what they know of God's commandments in their conscience, whether they submit to it or don't submit to it. And of course, without Christ, they are mainly not going to submit to it. And even when they do submit to it, they're not doing what God requires for the right reasons. Not out of love for Him, not out of a desire to give Him glory. So Jesus really here isn't, I think, addressing the fact that there are go those who are going to be, um, uh, well, judged, uh, they're, that um, they're not going to be judged for anything other than what he had said. But I do think he is addressing something in particular. And, and that is this, that whoever is blessed enough to hear the words of Christ, to hear the gospel, understanding, as I think you all understand, there are many people who have never heard it, uh, throughout the history of the world, there are many people who never will hear it. But those who have heard it and reject it and end up perishing in their sins. In other words, if they continue to do what the Jews are doing, that Jesus is addressing in this passage, which is not receiving him, not receiving his father and so forth, and they end up perishing, that gospel, Jesus says, is going to come back and condemn them at the last day. That which was meant to be a blessing to them is actually going to be a curse. Now, that's true of every blessing that God gives to us, right? If He gives it to us meaning well behind it, it's, it's good, it's a blessing. But if we don't receive it with thanksgiving, if we don't thank Him for it, if He offers us His Son and we reject His Son, 
that is going to speak against us on the day of judgment. That is why Jesus said what he said to Capernaum in Matthew chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. He says, and, and you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would remain to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. The reason being is that even though Sodom committed horrible acts of moral perversion, again, the ones that Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 1, the one that our world is beginning to, to say is not only acceptable, but you have to accept it, and you have to say it's good. They are going to get off easier on the day of judgment than Capernaum, who we might say didn't commit as horrible a sin. Uh, we might say that as we look. Well, they just rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected the gospel. These others were committing these moral perversions. Well, what Jesus is saying is much worse to reject the gospel, the light of the gospel, especially when you have Jesus in your town doing miracles and preaching the gospel. It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah and Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for Capernaum. Now, Peter later tells us that it would have been better not even to know God's truth, at least in this case, the gospel, than knowing it, to reject it or to turn away from it and to go back to living the way we were living before. Peter writes in 2 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22, if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would, have, excuse me, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true, the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. So basically what Jesus is telling us here is that those who have the gospel are going to be judged by the gospel. That which is the message of salvation in the end is going to speak against them if they don't receive it. And that judgment is going to be much more severe for them because they had it and rejected it. Now, again, why is it going to be more severe? Well, because of whose gospel it is. Remember, Jesus says that he is come as the Father's representative with the Father's message of goodwill, of, of reconciliation, and forgiveness of sins. It, it is offered freely. He is the one who has commissioned the Son to preach this message as we saw this morning, and as Jesus reminds us in verses 49 and 50 of our text. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to, what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. What is it the Father commanded Jesus to speak? He commanded him to speak about eternal life, the gospel. Judgment is going to be more severe because it is from the Father. It is a message of reconciliation and peace, but it's also going to be more severe because of the great blessing it is and privilege it is to be able to hear this gospel. Remember, there are so many who have never heard it and have perished in their sins. They weren't condemned for not hearing it. They were condemned for their sins. The gospel is simply the only way that we can escape judgment for our sins. It is a great blessing to have it. And that's the way the Lord intends it to be, a great blessing. But when we reject this great blessing in favor of sin, that blessing will speak out against us in the day of judgment and everybody else who rejects this great message of love and mercy and reconciliation. Now, I just want to take a couple of minutes to apply this because, again, as we saw this morning, Jesus is the ambassador from the Father. And having received that message, Jesus has called us to be ambassadors of Him uh, to the world. 
So just as the Father commanded Jesus to preach the gospel, so he has commanded us through the Great Commission, again, to preach the gospel to every nation. At the end of uh, Mark's gospel, he says, preach the gospel to every creature. This reminds us that we are still in the day of mercy. We are still in that day where the Lord is saving people, uh, where there is opportunity for individuals to come. For any here who might need the Lord Jesus Christ, for members of our family that still haven't received him, for friends that, you know, any, any contacts that we have, people that we know that don't know the Lord Jesus, our neighbors, people with whom we work, now is the opportunity. Today is a day of salvation. They still have the opportunity to receive Christ and to escape God's judgment. So the encouragement to us is to answer our Lord's call, first of all, and submit to his commandment. Even as Jesus said that the Father had commanded him to preach this good news, Jesus has commanded us to do precisely the same thing, to take this gospel to others while the opportunity still exists. Now, we do know that the day is coming when Jesus returns again and the day or the hour will be closed, the day of mercy will be over. But it can end in other ways as well, right? We aren't going to live forever. We're not, I mean, here on this earth, we are not going to have opportunity forever. So let's make use of those opportunities. The people that we're sharing the gospel with aren't going to be around forever. One day they're going to die. And when they die, the day of their opportunity also will come to an end. It's a point in demand once to die and then the judgment. So while we have the opportunity, while it is the day of salvation, let's share the message with others. Now, as we speak to them, remember what the message is. It is a message of mercy. It is a message of grace. It is a, a message of reconciliation. The Father desires to be reconciled to all who will come to him through Christ. Now, I do believe the Lord would have us to warn them of judgment. They need to know what they're in danger of before they're going to turn to Christ. Let's just make sure that we don't condemn them before that day. As James and John, when the village of the Samaritans wouldn't receive Jesus Christ, Lord, just put an end to them. Destroy them now. But we shouldn't have that attitude. Jesus didn't have that attitude. We've already seen what his attitude was, even when they sinned against him. Even when they crucified him, he still desired their salvation. So let's not be too quick to condemn because many people have to hear the gospel many times before they receive Jesus Christ. There may be a few who receive Jesus the first time, and there's many people who may hear about Jesus many times and never receive him. But most often the people who are going to be converted have to hear the gospel many times before they will actually be converted by that gospel before the Spirit of God will work to quicken them to life. And if that is the case, which I believe it is, we can't write them off so quickly like James and John and just say, oh, they rejected Christ. So Now, we do know that there are times in the gospel where Jesus said, if they don't receive you in this town, go to the next, because there wasn't much time. Okay, it was, they had to get through all of Israel and preach that gospel during the time when Jesus was there. But I don't think that Jesus meant to say, never go back there. There's no hope for those people. They reject you once, and that's it. Uh, if they reject what we have to say, we need to continue to warn them of that coming day. We need to continue to offer them God's salvation as long as the Lord continues to leave the door open for us to tell them, as long as they're still alive, as long as they're still willing to listen to us. We try, need to try to share the gospel with them. And then finally, the point about those who hear the gospel and reject it, having to face severe judgment. Well, you know, that might make us somewhat reluctant to share the gospel because we don't want that to happen to, you know, to people. That it gets, you know, becomes worse for them in the day of judgment. But we, we obviously don't have that as an option for several reasons. We really have no other choice. I mean, what's going to happen to them if they don't hear it? They are certainly going to perish forever. Remember, we were reminded this morning, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
We have to share the gospel or no one is going to be saved. But if we share it with them, there's the possibility that the Lord will bring them to himself. This is the only way they can possibly come to him is through the gospel. It is the power of God into salvation. It is the means he uses. We can't expect God to save people in the blue without the gospel. If that were the case, all evangelism would cease, all missions would cease. We can just simply sit down and let God do what he's going to do. But we know that that is not how he works. He has called us to do it. So we need to get the message out to them so that they might be saved. Again, that's exactly what Jesus told us to do. He has commanded us to go to all the nations to tell everyone that we possibly can so that this is not an option for us. It's not an option. This is what we must do if we are to be faithful to Christ. And of course, if we're believers, we know that is what he calls us to. That is what we must do. That is what our hearts tell us we want to do. So let's seek to be faithful in telling them. And then finally, let's remind ourselves that telling them is a good thing. Yes, there's a possibility that every good thing that a person receives can speak out against them in the day of judgment, right? But that doesn't mean it's not good. And it doesn't mean you're not doing them good. And it doesn't mean it's not a blessing for them to hear it and you know, for you to be a witness to them. Because the gospel is good. The gospel is an act of mercy, an act of mercy that God would bring it to someone. It is an offer of grace and of reconciliation. And that is the reason why it is such a great sin for anyone to reject it. When the God of the universe is, is so graciously disposed to send his son into the world, to, to put him through all this, and then to offer him to all mankind, and then for the people who hear the offer simply to reject it, and you know, to uh, dismiss Jesus. It, it's such a great sin for them to do it because it is such a gracious offer. But just because they might refuse this gracious and infinitely precious gift is no reason for us not to offer it because it is precious. It is a blessing for them if they will receive it, they will hear it. So while we have the opportunity, while it is the day of grace, while it, while it is the day of salvation, let's offer to Jesus to as many people as we possibly can that the Lord might call as many as he will to himself. Again, remembering the parable of the sower. The sower takes the seed and he, he broadcasts it every direction that he possibly can in order that some of that seed might fall into good soil. Let's not be concerned about the response so much. Uh, you know, whether there's going to be people who reject it. Let's look at the good soil. There are people who are going to receive it. Our Lord calls us to broadcast it. It is the day of salvation. So as we have opportunity, let's share that gospel so that people might be saved. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to help us to take this to heart and to surrender our wills to him and to seek to do what we can to fulfill this.